Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Chancellor Cohn, for attending. Uh, thank you all for your excitement and enthusiasm for being and come out in such foul weather to be here with us. Scott and I tend to like to talk a lot, and so um, we have made a deal. He and I are going to play a kind of a game. Uh, we are limiting each other to two minutes of talking, and then we will tag, and uh, the other one will have to take over. Um, we're going to try not to finish each other's sentences, although we have a tendency to do that in casual conversation. Um, this, I think, is actually one of the uh, benefits of having found uh, such a rich and wonderful collaborative um, pairing. Um, is my two minutes up yet? <laughs> I haven't even started. I'll hold it up when I start. All right. Um, we have been, uh, just to give you some prefatory remarks, we, as we've been working together uh, to uh, try to bring uh, video games and computer games onto DU campus and to explore uh, video games in, a, in an interdisciplinary fashion and actually to acknowledge the interdisciplinarity that is inherent in the act of creating video games, um, we have... Um, decided that we were going to look at uh, games in a very particular light. We were going to ask a question, uh, can games be purposefully good? And start from there. In trying to address that question, we chose to ignore certain controversies that are in the world uh, with regard to what video games that are commercially available do. And we feel that um, being in this privileged place in a university where we should be exploring what could be rather than necessarily uh, reaffirming what is, uh, we decided to just define a set of games or a set of um, parameters through which video games might be good. Uh, and we realized in so doing that we had created or invoked and hoped to create this field called humane games. Um, to summarize, I've got, I've got time. Um, we have games for health, games that will address um, health issues through, uh, and they will be either palliative or therapeutic, and they will be addressing health issues either through the gameplay or through the making of the games. And we're going to have that kind of a dichotomy or that kind of parallelism throughout. Um, we will be doing both games that, that are good through play. How's that? I'm trying, trying to make sure that that works out all right. That's going to fall. All right. Games that are good through play as well as games that are good or cause some good to come into the world through their creation, through the act of their creation. Uh, games for education. Uh, also, again, uh, typically we have a history of games for education through play, where the educational moment is in the act of play. But we're also proposing that there is, through the act of creation, a very, educa uh, very strong... Oh. So you're going to hear that a few times. I just want to very briefly echo that uh, both of us are really honored to be here and talking about games, because who would have thought about 10 years ago that a university would have the foresight to understand that games can be something that is good. And what Raphael was going to continue on with not only games for education, but also games for change, which are um, games that advocate or raise awareness for a cause. And I don't do it justice. Raphael is um, pretty much one of the um, initiators of this academic field with a very influential paper called Programming Pixels in Politics and some of his early games that you are going to see. So I'm going to start with talking about games from education and Raphael's going to be talking when he gets his two minutes um, about uh, socially conscious games and then eventually we'll work in games for health. So there's two types of games for education. Education through playing games, which is what many of you are probably familiar with, and education through making games. And so for playing games, I just want to do some of the blockbusters of the past. Um, Read a Rabbit, which is uh, something that many of your kids have probably played. You probably can see some of your favorites here. Um, if any of you are 25 or younger here, amongst our staff, usually you don't have faculty 25 and younger, you probably played Read a Rabbit. You definitely played Oregon Trail. Um, I haven't seen anybody stand up and go, yeah! Um, but uh, there we go. Okay, now we got a few. Um, 
This game has uh, devotees, including the culture, the fanboy culture. You can go out and buy t-shirts for a game from 20 years ago. So, um, Math Blaster, math can be fun. We're going to be talking about that more a little bit later with an up-to-date version. Um, it's not Math Blaster. Uh, SimCity, I uh, want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, SimCity is a game where you actually do urban planning. Um, and you have to worry about the economy, you have to worry about your people rioting, um, and there can be natural disasters, and it's actually quite a learning experience. <laughs> All right, so when I started doing this back around 1998, I, um, I asked the question, I, I was really un un unsatisfied with it. <laughs> With the, with the kinds of games that existed in the world, and I really wanted to make a game that I would want to play. And I uh, started to ask the question, can games, are games capable, as an art form, as a medium, uh, would they be capable of carrying heavy subject matter? Um, and rather than explore in a, in a scholarly way, I actually just decided to try and experiment and try to make some that did. Um, in the interim, in the time in between, in the last 10 years, we've started to see a number of games available uh, commercially at large that are actively trying to handle uh, strong subject matter. So I'll play Free Rice with you really quick. Uh, free Rice is, is interesting. It's available to play for free. As you play, you do good. This is a, it's a word game and it tests your own intelligence. It, you can raise your intelligence quotient, your vocabulary level. Now, can somebody help me out? Shout out, what is Hatchel? The carrying bag? Thank you. All right. It, we build community that way as well. Um, Jake's, I'm thinking of Jake as a bachelor. We'll see if I'm wrong or right. I was, you know, it was an outhouse. With every, <laughs> in this game, there's a, there's a really interesting contextual framework here. In this game, every correct answer earns 10 grains of rice. And the 10 grains of rice are donated to a, a, a a world chartered uh, charity. And so the more people that play this game, the more rice gets donated. Now the operative question is, where does that rice come from? Where does the money for the rice come from? There's actually advertising around the bottom of this game, uh, and it will change as you play. I'm gonna, I, I don't wanna, I, I'm not paying attention to whether I'm playing well or, or not. Um, the advertisers have decided that they are happy to donate the money. The hardest part of this talk is not um, finishing Raf what Raphael was just saying there. So supposedly, uh, the younger generation, of which I don't really consider myself part of, um, has attention span issues and need multitasking. This is your opportunity to have two talks at once. <laughs> so also going back, uh, Humongous Games Entertainment had a whole bunch of games. Pajama Sam, Freddy Fish were two of the most famous ones. There was lots of puzzle solving, lots of educational opportunities. But this company also did everything right in terms of inclusiveness. They had characters of every color of the light, um, rainbow. They had uh, captions for the hearing impaired and was just pretty much a really progressive company for the time. Um, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Geography can be fun. Um, that You may not believe that, but go and play the game and uh, you will find it actually can be true. Um, now I want to talk about games being made today. At DU, we have uh, a team of people with a grant from uh, the Head Start Foundation. Professor Mario Lopez in math is the PI working with Alvaro Arias and Tony Linder. And they have a large grant to create mathematical learning games for preschoolers, specifically targeting low socioeconomic status kids. And uh, their game is based on um, fundamental math principles that kids need before 
they go on into kindergarten to get them a head start um, and to be ready. And there's lots of mathematical concepts. This one is trying to teach you just number sense. And so, obviously, I'm supposed to click on two. This is the more advanced version. First, it just starts out with um, fingers. Then it starts out with um, the blocks. And then it also has the um, number um, um, representation. So using this one, you obviously go around. And uh, um, there's sound, which um, all game designers will tell you, you have to show their game the right way. And I'm going to be chastised later for not having sound, but too bad. Um, the sound is also in Spanish as well as English, and for the demographics that are being addressed with this game, that's extremely important. Um, so this one is teaching number sense, and then the next game is teaching spatial reasoning. And so if you see up at the top right, I'll go ahead and finish this. There's some arrows over here at the top right that will help you. You're supposed to be able to interpret them and guide your frog over to eat the, uh, eat the flies. Right? And so if, you get, if you're able to make the, yeah. and occasionally the frog will burp. Now, <laughs> we'll, we'll jump back real fast to, uh, to games for change uh, and socially conscious video games. The, um, let's see if it'll remember where my slide is now. And specifically about trying to, you know, the, the Free Rice uh, tried to address world hunger. Uh, a video game called uh, September 12th by Gonzalo Frasca, uh, who was one of the first PhDs in the world um, in, uh, in video game studies, uh, created a video game that was trying to capture, uh, and th this is a little bit more somber. This, is, this, this one's really tough, and it requires a whole lot of, uh, of contextualization when I talk about it. Um, on the heels of our experience here in the United States on, on September 12th, when we had uh, the, the world's attention and the world's goodwill, and, uh, and uh, he wanted to try and make a, 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 an editorial commentary on, on the decision to act with aggression and to act with bombs. Uh, and so he created a game using the idioms of the classic first-person shooter video game, where you have a, an aiming reticule uh, that is the game is, is basically the avatar for the presence of the player in the world from this very uh, bird's eye point of view, and you have a, a Middle Eastern styled village as a representation uh, that is underneath this reticule, and the player has a choice. The player has a choice to shoot or not to shoot. The, default, the sort of default setting for video games in the, in, that are in the world is for the player to shoot. Uh, this is the idiom that we have learned from uh, video games. And so in response to that, when the player chooses to shoot uh, in, in order to eliminate what looks like terrorists in the population of the village, what we see is a radicalization occur in that population. And then what looks like terrorists become more terrorists. And so this, this, and so then the player's next impulse would be to shoot more. Um, and should the player follow that strategy, the village will be filled with terrorists and bombed out buildings. Um, and so. <laughs> this is the one I'll give you. This is the most important one. And so the player comes to realize through counterexample that the winning strategy for this game was to not have shot at all to begin with. And I think that this is where the power of these kinds of experiences start to play out. And I'll let you think about that while we change that. We really could not come up with a better way to uh, share time because we both just really have a lot to say, or so we think we do. Um, I just want to say a couple more things real briefly about the game. Um, kids play math. Um, this is actually a series of games. Whoops. 
And this series of games um, is being driven based on the successes, ultimately, when it's all done. The successes that the children have while playing the game will drive the next games that they are going to play. And hence, they're working with education experts, um, Tony Linder and some other people, on how kids learn these concepts and then try and find a logical path that will be able to automatically tune itself. There's a computer scientist involved. We have to use AI and all sorts of computer science-y stuff to uh, optimize the kids' learning experience. It's quite novel. Now I want to move on to talking about games for education by making games. Um, I'm biased. I actually think this is probably the most powerful way to learn with games is because you have to understand the content material for the game that you're going to be dealing with. I just want to touch first on one national product, um, project that's a bit similar to the next one I'm going to talk about that we're doing here at DU. And this is a after school program and also during the summer for uh, middle school girls creating games. And this was done in Flash and Action Script, which is quite challenging actually. And um, they had a fair amount of success with getting young women empowered and interested in going into science and technology as a result of this. Um, what we are doing at DU is something called P4 Games, which is Programming, Pixels, Play, and Pedagogy. And this is a project that involves uh, Deborah Austin right here in the front from Education and Law, Raphael and myself, and Susan Meyer, who actually I haven't seen Susan, I don't know if she's here. Um, and this is a large National Science Foundation grant where again, it's to try and get kids interested as far as the NSF is concerned, it's to get kids interested in science and technology. As far as our team is concerned, it's to get kids interested in going to college, and if they go into, going to, to uh, college, and if they want to go in science and technology, which we nudge them that way, that's really cool too. But it's really about empowering kids that may not go to school from demographics that they would be first generation students and getting them to go to school. You know, I think we should bring Drew up. Uh, that's coming just a little bit. Just a little bit? All right. All right, so in order to bring levity back into the, into the, into the proceedings, I'm going to show a couple of the games that I've made. Um, I, sent, I, I have a black sense of humor and a, a satirical approach. And so the, the video games Crosser and La Migra, which were created while I was still in residence at the University of Texas at El Paso, um, are uh, biting satire. Um, we, um, in this first one, Crosser, you are, as a player, um, you embody the, uh, someone who is sitting on the U.S.-Mexico border on the Mexican side, and you help them across. Uh, and so the victory condition is to get them up to the top of the screen to the visa. Now, it, uh, it, it's, it's always tickled me to, to have this game played in the United States, especially by Anglos, uh, because we put them in the shoes of somebody who's actually trying to push, help somebody across into the, into the border and, and help them find a new and, and, and perhaps better economic circumstance for themselves. Oh, oh, okay. I'm going to get lucky today because the helicopter flew over and the car decided not to, not to pay attention to me. Um, I, I don't always win this game. I, I, I think I've, I just got lucky. Come on back. Oh, I forgot to press start. I'm sorry, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, this was done in collaboration with several graduate students while I was there, and, um, and they each uh, took on a component. So the, the, the notion of collaboration within video games is also very deeply embedded. There, there are many different skill sets that need to be brought to bear, brought, uh, to bear on the task. And, um, and so we'll, we'll, and we'll, we'll reiterate and, and, and reaffirm that the idea of the, of the many different skill sets and the, and the opportunities for collaboration within the making of games in just a second. I'm going to show the other, the other point of view, a, a, because it, in terms of critique, this particular game, Crosser, is a flattening. It's a flattening of the realities on the U.S.-Mexico border, and it, it really uh, emphasizes a singular point of view. Um, in a year or two later, I uh, sat down, my collaborators had, had left, uh, gone on to graduate, uh, graduate from, oh shoot, that was the wrong, um, that's an undocumented feature of this game. I'd, we, um, 
in this game, you actually play uh, a member of the Immigration and Naturalization Service Agency. You are a member of the ICE uh, at this point. It's called ICE in our uh, sort of post-George uh, II world. Um, and you, you are attempting to do the opposite of the other game. You are attempting to choose whether or not you uh, capture people who are trying to come into the U.S. Uh, now, in this game, you're not rewarded for killing. As, I, as you saw already, you, there is an opportunity uh, to, to use violence and violent force. I had to include that. It would be part of the model because the, the, uh, the officers are, uh, they are an armed force. Um, but you aren't rewarded if you happen to um, kill um, each one of these characters. In, in video games of this sort, typically the characters don't have personalities of their own. Um, oh, I'll finish that one, thanks. Uh, typically the characters don't have personalities of their own, but in this game we, um, we chose to make sure that each of the, of, the, of the characters had a distinct personality. And actually I fell in love with each one of the characters and it took me about three months before I could give up, bring up the courage to draw their death scenes. Um, but it was really important that the player have the opportunity to see and feel what that the consequences of their action were inside of the game universe. And when the player ha starts killing the other characters, they cannot win. This game cannot be won through violence. Uh, and that's something that ha you know, I, I reveal that to you here because of the presentation format that we we're, we we are. Uh, um, we're within, but it, that that's actually revealed to the player through play, um, and and that is, is also a kind of a contradiction in terms from the classic video commercial video game uh, that, that we have on the market now. And so, the, the, in this way, we're turning the gameplay into something new and different, and and we're starting to see the adoption of this attitude uh, in other research centers that are experimenting with video games today. So part of gaming culture is to see if you can cheat the system, and Raphael was demonstrating that at the beginning by not setting the timer, so. Um, I will cede my next two minutes to you. What, I'll, I'll take them when I actually need them. Right. Um, so the motivation for our project was, first of all, to increase student interest in attending college at all, to get them interested in STEM, and to leverage student interest in games to do that. And so this project has three parts to it. It had a, um, a high school summer game camp, ninth and 10th graders living on campus, and the last year we actually went out to the schools and did week-long programs at the schools. What we call Teacher Game Institute. This is a uh, four-week professional development course for high school teachers to teach them about games and game making so that they can go back to their schools and they can teach their students how they can learn about math and uh, computer science and programming and art and design in an integrated fashion so that they can create games. And then working with the teachers as they implemented um, their programs in their schools. To date, we've had about 150 students in the camps, 50 teachers, and about 600 students in the uh, um, schools. And this year, it's going to be look, looking like a lot more. Um, this is requires putting together computer science, math, art, and design in order to create a game. You actually need all of these components. Um, large professional corporations have individuals that do different parts. If you're making your own game, you need to do all of it, and it's a wonderful learning experience. In addition, any content area can now become an opportunity for learning because if you want to create a game about oh, chemistry, well, you have to understand the chemical principles behind what you're going to put in your game before you can make the game. Um, we actually had an English uh, teacher teach uh, literature through having her students create games about the novels. And she said that they actually read the novels more than they normally do. Surprise. <laughs> Um, so just briefly, the game camp, it was two weeks, and they actually spent during the summer seven and a half hours a day in the classroom working. Um, they also played a lot. There's lots of programming. I'm not going to bore you with programming details, but these are the normal things you learn when you're learning how to program. You have to do that for games. And I will trade off. Nope. Nope. I can follow the rules. <laughs> Yeah, in Spanish, in, especially in Colombia where I come from, we have the malicia indígena, which is a kind of a mischievous uh, way to game systems. Um, and uh, all right, so 
Very quickly, well, I'll show you one more uh, game that has to do a little bit with mal the Malicia Indígena, um, where uh, it, it directly addressing the... Um, I forgot again. That, was, that wasn't on purpose. Uh, addressing the, uh, the, the illicit drug agriculture in, uh, in Central and South America. Uh, I was born in Colombia, and, uh, and I have a, an extended family in Colombia that uh, is involved in agriculture and is involved in industry. And uh, the policies of, um, uh, implemented by uh, the Reagan administration and, and reaffirmed ever since uh, with regard to drug war have, uh, have done a, uh, they've done a number of, of negative things uh, to, to the, both the society and the culture uh, back in, in Colombia. And, you know, our, our uh, our need for, for cocaine up here has also uh, done uh, a couple of things in that regard. Uh, so what I started to look at how, um, the, the, it's, it's really tough, because this, this game is, 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 a, is a sliver. It's a, it's a really, really fine sliced sliver of, of, of a bigger picture idea that we've got, where the, um, where the player is trying to figure out whether they're going to grow drugs or whether they're gonna try to grow another cash crop. In this particular game, the player has uh, poppies that they're trying to eradicate and butterflies that are trying to propagate. Well, they're, they're not trying to propagate. They just do what comes naturally. Uh, they're pollinating a mature poppy uh, plants. And, um, and so the game player is supposed to come down and try to chop down the poppy fields. Um, and occasionally there is a, a, some sort of magic that happens and the poppies really just uh, proliferate. And um, the... Uh, I'm going to stop there because I, I can give you back some time. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so there's fundamental art concepts that you would normally learn when you're learning basic studio art and drawing. And uh, design has a whole bunch of principles that are actually really sophisticated, in my opinion, for trying to teach to uh, middle school and um, high school students. But it's surprising how much they pick them up. Um, I just want to show you a couple screenshots of some of the games that were created by some of our students. And the games that came out of the past three years were very different than I would have expected because I'm not a 13-year-old girl. Um, <laughs> so this is a game where you go out and you pick up all your friends and you have to uh, get to the ice cream store before the time runs out. Uh, this was a game done by a young man on recycling, um, and basically if you don't pick up the trash fast enough, you get buried in trash. <laughs> um, this was a dancing game where you have to type STAR as they light up, and it had a beautiful dance sequence for ballet, and the young woman that did this was a um, ballet dancer. Uh, this one I actually think is pretty interesting. We had a kid from one of the worst parts of Chicago um, come out to our camp and he created a game about uh, putting a fire out in a farm and saving the animals. I don't think he ever saw green, let alone a farm. Um, this one was a reverse fair fairy tale where you have the princess that is saving the prince um, and there was a series of tasks. There was a, one of the things that teenage kids, preteens do with games is they have a list this long of what they want to put in the game. Um, and she had about 20 levels, and I think she implemented two. Um, and one of them, which is normal, one of them is a lawn mowing game, and I don't know why, but the princess had to mow the lawn. <laughs> Another one is a babysitting game. Um, this one, what happened is you push the start button as the parents leave, and you, the babysitter, the kids all take off in di different directions, <laughs> and you have to catch them before um, the parents get back, otherwise you lose. Next one is a waiter game, and in this game, um, you are a waiter, and there's an earthquake, and you have to decide whether you're gonna get out your coveted uh, um, chef implements and cooking tools, or get the customers out. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the, cust the customers were drawn as myself, Rafael, and Carlos, who isn't with us. Um, he's left and graduated, and so somehow getting the customers out didn't seem that important to him. <laughs> This was your basic uh, ninja zombie game, which is what you would be expecting from 14-year-old boys. Um, this one was a little unusual. This was a fighting nun game. Um, <laughs> it was a very devout young woman that created this game. 
Um, and the art sequence and the fight sequence was really impressive. Um, this was our hippie in Vietnam um, and trying to promote peace. Uh, this was a basketball combination football game that allowed you to tackle people on the basketball court to win and had cheerleaders. <laughs> this was a game where you were a farmer that was coming around and um, you had to, uh, sorry, the, there was, the farmers coming around would get the chicken and you had to avoid the farmers, otherwise you'd get caught. And I just want to talk about this one a little bit briefly and then I'm going to hand off to Drew. Um, this was a game made by, this was actually our very first game camp, which actually I'll tell you one more thing about our game camp. If you guys ever run a camp, don't put 14 year old boys and 14 year old girls on the same floor of the dorms. It's not a good idea. <laughs> um, at any rate, during our first game camp, nothing bad happened. Our counselors slept on, in the hallway. They put their mattresses in the hallway and put the girls at that end and the boys at that end. It was okay. They didn't like us though. Anyways, this young man that created this game was my height and a whole lot larger than I am. Um, and he was not afraid of anything. But it was pretty clear that there was one thing that intimidated him, and that was his father. And he used this as a way of expressing something that I don't think he would have articulated otherwise. That is his father in the bottom left-hand corner, and you had so much time to mow the lawn, otherwise your dad was going to be mad at you, um, which was pretty interesting. Um, and so with that, one of our campers, not that first year, but the next year, as Greg said, he has played one game now. Um, we're working on him for more, but he started with a really great one, which was created by Drew Matheson, and she is, was 14 at the time, and this was uh, Game Camp 2007 that she was here. She's currently a high school junior slash senior, i.e. she's doing her last two years in one year um, at Broomfield High School, and she wants to major in one of music, math, or computer science. Um, and we're gonna have Drew come up here and present her game for you. Hello. Um, I made this game in 2007, like they said, um, as a statement about women in the workplace. Uh, that was just something that Thought, I thought that I might face sometime in my lifetime. So, um, the point of the game is to, you're playing a female worker, and you're supposed to collect the keys to success while avoiding your male coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will demo it here for you. We are in the little workplace. Unfortunately, if you come in contact with one of your male coworkers, your morale is lowered. show you what it is like to win this. It's oh. <laughs> harder than I remembered. <laughs> One more to go. <laughs> Tough day at the office here. <laughs> oh, 
Oh no, two doors. Let's try that one. <laughs> So um, Drew managed to put in uh, something that was important to her into her game, and uh, Provost Kvistad played this as his very first game. Part of gaming culture is fanboy culture, and that includes posters. <laughs> and so Drew is presenting that. And yes, Drew is considering applying to DU for one of her education, her future educational experiences. So. We're going to do everything we can to get her here. All right. Um, I want to show a couple of games um, that are being done by graduate students and, un and uh, undergraduate students here at DU as well in this socially conscious realm uh, or in the games for change realm. Um, Launch that real fast. Hello. I'll grab this one. This next one was called, is a, it's an anti-war war game. It was done by Devin Monins, who's earned his MFA and um, is now uh, transitioning out into the, uh, into the work world. Um, it's a, it, again, trying to, to uh, I'll just play it. It, it, it. I could talk about this game for hours. It's a beautiful poetic expression and it's, um, so I'm, I'm the little guy in the window, all right? And the rule is simple. I have to try and not let the tank run me over. And I didn't make it that time. Um, it's, we're starting to look at uh, unwinnable games as a way to communicate to, uh, to people. So this, this is a, um, it's a kind of another kind of expression. Now, the, you do actually have bullets. I'm not sure where my action button is. Uh, but there's no way you're, you're going to take, uh, take this tank out. And this, again, is a commentary on, on other video games that, that glorify war rather than, than demonstrate the, uh, the actual costs uh, to an individual um, or to to a society. I'll stop that one. <laughs> Quit. Save and <coughs> I'm gonna let you go now. Real briefly, uh, we are scientists and we were studying the efficacy of this as a learning approach. Uh, middle column is before they took the camp. These were the campers. The right column is after. They learned stuff. Um, we also did a self-assessment about uh, game design and art. They learned stuff. Um, Teacher Game Institute, um, they did the exact same curriculum as our students. Um, it was 120 hours of professional development throughout the year. Um, and we had them create games two years ago about the election. And so one of them basically had to do with uh, buying of votes. I, I mean, sorry, uh, spending money on campaigning. Did I say that? Um, <laughs> Uh, another one was very similar, but it had to do with influence from various political people, and it was interesting watching the teachers to debate what influence the Clintons had on Obama. And another one created by an English teacher was basically about the debates, um, and uh, it became Pong, where you had uh, McCain and Obama going up and down, knocking debate issues back and forth. And uh, again, we studied them, and they learned stuff. 
Um, so I want to talk about other ways of learning by making games. We have an undergraduate degree here at DU, which you may or may not know of. It's Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts. That um, The Bachelor of Arts is a double major with Studio Art, EMAD, and DMS. And it's basically computer science mixed with math, mixed with art, mixed with design. And it's the type of learning that I think is really going to become more and more important over the next 20, 30 years, regardless whether it's games or some other discipline, creativity and technical put together. Um, I'm going to be offering a service learning course in the spring, and the idea is to train DU students how to create games so they can go out and mentor and work with high school students, and Overland High School and probably Montbello and MLK are going to be working with us on this one. And we're going to be having students creating um, games for the Game Jam. I thought I stopped that. Okay. We should probably go straight to the uh, collaboration service. Yeah, okay. So, real, we, we sort of skip Games for Health. Um, I'm just going to simply say that games are being used for training um, of medical people for doing triage. They've also been used for treating, um, um, not treating cancer patients, but for getting young adolescent ca cancer patients to take their drugs. And they've shown that by playing the game, the kids understand why they need to take their drugs. Um, and actually, every time they take chemo, they get more sick, and so they don't want to take them. This game actually convinced them that they should. Um, and also, I've written a proposal with Martha Wadsworth in psychology to use games to invoke stress as part of a um, coping strategy experimental study. So there's all sorts of health applications for games. Um, to do, to do, to do. All right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to try to zoom real fast so that we have time for some questions because I, I see the time and we're, we're going to get tight. Um, again, to reaffirm, reiterate, uh, games are a multidisciplinary task. We have actually tried to look at them in a synthetic fashion by having students learn modest scale games where because of the modesty of the scale, they are able to learn the programming, they're able to learn the art, they're able to learn the design, and they're able to synthesize these three uh, in, along with the synthesis of a subject area uh, that, that they feel passionate about and express themselves through the creation of, of, a, of a video game or a computer-based game. Um, larger scale works demand collaboration. And um, I'm going to jump past your cost and... Uh, and there are challenges to collaboration in our academy, in our academic space, because we don't have the habits intrinsic in our training as to, uh, in, as to how to do collaboration right. Uh, our, our, our habits are that we work pretty much solo or that we have a kind of a supporting, nurturing infrastructure that we try to build underneath us so that we can get uh, solo or primary credit for uh, for what we have done, for what we have accomplished. The collaborative nature of the video game really, and, to, and our collab, collective collaboration really necessitates that we are willing to subsume and submerge our, any sort of individual credit to the success of the collaborative. And, and this is not natural. It's something that has to be learned and has to be trained and, and, uh, and gotten wrong, frankly, for a while before we learn how to get it right. Um, and so, um, did I, yep. I'll, I'll, I'll leave us with that point. We've got to try to work this out to, to, to try and get it right. Okay, now you're up. You're up. I got that one. And I think that was the last time you'll hear it beep. Um, and so, um, it's, it's hard for academics to be humble. Um, but you need to be humble if you're going to get along in an interdisciplinary team. Also another challenge is uh, divisional systems and the silo politics and the rewards that one gets as a faculty member for bringing stuff back to their division. Uh, major obstacle for any type of interdisciplinary work and games is just one example. So what can we do to promote interdisciplinary work? Um, first of all, and this was a really hard one for me, um, I'm sure you've all heard the expression if you have uh, a hammer everything looks like a nail. Uh, well, um, I do spatial temporal databases and I have a lot of tools in my basket and I try and apply all three of them, you know, maybe there's four, um, to every problem I see. Um, and to find out that sometimes these, at first, a little bit harder to understand but very elegant 
approaches to a problem that I never would have thought of might actually be better than mine, maybe. Um, and uh, you have to be open to that if you're going to actually move, and you have to move out of your comfort zone. And seeing as I have the chancellor and the provost in the audience, <laughs> here's a new idea, which is uh, we create a new program where people write a proposal that they want to start doing interdisciplinary work, and they get a one-course teaching reduction per year if they can show why taking two classes per year in another discipline is going to foster interdisciplinary research in the long run. Um, and obviously there has to be some mechanism because you know, somebody might abuse it, but I, I can't see that. Um, another one is encouraging dual appointments between different divisions would be wonderful. Um, I know at least one person would be interested in that, but there's many people on campus that really do cross disciplines. Um, and this would um, be a great benefit to interdisciplinarity. Um, and some of my DMS friends uh, were sort of role models about what can go wrong with this. No, don't double the service. Um, and uh, lastly, to also include, um, increase interdisciplinarity on campus, um, institutes that are interdisciplinary. Because all we've been talking about is humane games, here is one institute, but this is one of many institutes that could be created that would be cross-divisional. Um, and uh, um, we would like to create humane games and um, plant the flag and make DU the preeminent school in humane games. And so an institute around that that's drawing people together from all across campus. We have not brought in psychology, we have not brought in English, we have not brought in music yet. And all of these things are parts of games. And you'll notice that we already have started discussing and we have people from all of these divisions. Um, and then instantly people say, well, which one gets listed first? Um, and again, that's ego creeping right back in there. And so what we've been doing for the past three years is everything's been alphabetical and all problems go away. Um, I think we're done. Questions? Thank you.